may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Joan of Arc, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, dive right into Matthew 14. Just a couple of things first, though. Uh, tomorrow we have Tenebrae at 6.30 a.m. It's the night office for the Triduum. Uh, so we'll have that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning, 6.30 a.m., uh, along with the, uh, the, the rituals, the uh, liturgies for the, the different days. And also, uh, if you have questions, you can submit those on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. Um, and so um, please submit those, and we'll get those to th at the end of the class. Okay, we left off with chapter 13. We're going to move right into Matthew chapter 14. And so Matthew chapter 14 uh, begins with uh, St. John the Baptist, his, uh, his uh, beheading, and then it moves on into um, uh, our, our blessed Lord, uh, going into a number of acts of mercy. So Matthew chapter 14 through 18 is a lot about the mercy of God in his kingdom. So that's a big focus of those chapters. We can see our Lord's mercy. We'll see it in a moment here. We'll see about the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, acts of mercy of Almighty God, uh, other miracles that our Lord does out of mercy for his kingdom. So um, let's... Um, Let's go into that. Uh, we'll kind of skip the, um, you know, the, the beheading of St. John the Baptist. We know the story, um, but uh, we're going to move on to um, what our Lord did after having heard of it. He went out into the mountain to pray. So uh, we, we uh, pick up with Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 14, the feeding of the 5,000. So here, our blessed Lord goes out to the multitude and to a desert place apart. He goes to pray and the people come out to him and he sees them and he, he sees that he has compassion on them. We see in verse 14, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick, right? And then the disciples come to him, they say, Send them away the multitudes, right? So they can go and buy food for themselves. Now, this happened in the, the Jewish side of Galilee. And so this feeding of the 5,000 takes place for mainly Jews. Um, now, let's, let's uh, see what our Lord says. He, you know, he says to them, uh, there's no need for them to go. Give you them something to eat. And they said, we have not here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, them, bring them uh, to me. Then notice in verse 19, he's, notice the words that are used by St. Matthew. Again, St. Matthew's writing his gospel to Jewish converts and to convert Jews to the Catholic faith. And he s sets down certain words that are evocative of ritualistic, liturgical language that the Jews would understand. Notice the things he says, you know, have them recline or sit down. It might be in your translation, recline upon the grass. He took up the five loaves. He blessed them, broke them, gave the loaves to his disciples, looking up to heaven. These key terms that are in there are actually repeated in the Last Supper. These are actions that the priest does as well at Holy Mass. He looks up to heaven. He blesses the bread. He breaks it at a certain point in Holy Mass. So all these things are liturgical actions that the Jews would recognize as being connected with a liturgical event. So our Lord in feeding the 5,000 is not just feeding them in a uh, physical way. He's pointing forward to what he will institute, and that's the Holy Eucharist and the Holy Mass. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out about this. There are Old Testament bread miracles in addition to the miracle that Moses provided of the manna in the desert. Are you aware of that? There's actually a couple of places where uh, loaves were multiplied uh, in the Old Testament. Not as dramatically as what ha would happen here. Um, but let's take a look at this. Remember, first of all, that event where uh, David goes in, his men are starving. He goes into the tabernacle. At this point, the temple had not been built, so that uh, that tabernacle was erected there. And uh, David goes in and he says, give me what you have, even if it only be five loaves, he says. It's interesting that he says that. Even if it only be five loaves, give me what you have, you know, to feed my men. And so the priest instead gave him the loaves of proposition, the 12 loaves that were there. Now that's key because 
David asks for five loaves. He is uh, instead given the 12, right? The loaves of proposition, which were set out in groups of 12. And that's what he fed his men with, right? That's in 1 Kings chapter 21, uh, verse 3. And so then there's also another bread miracle that's in the Old Testament. You may not be aware of this is where uh, uh, Elisha, the prophet, he succeeded uh, Elijah. Elisha uh, had a bread miracle as well. And we find this in the fourth book of Kings, chapter 4, verse 42. It says that uh, there was a man who came, uh, a man of God, bringing bread of the first fruits. Remember, we talked about the first fruits uh, the other day in the catechism class. The first fruits, 20 loaves of barley. So now he didn't have five, but he had 20 loaves. And he said, give to the people that they may eat. The servant of Elisha said, how much is this that I should set it before a hundred men? Remember, does that sound a little familiar when um, they said there is a boy here who has five loaves and two fish, but what is this among so many? And then here they have 20 barley loaves in the Old Testament event here of Elisha in 4 Kings uh, chapter 4. And he says, how much is this that I should set before 100 men? Here he's only trying to feed 100 with 20 loaves of bread, but he does it. There's a multiplication of those loaves and it feeds 100. Not a spectacular miracle but it is a miracle and so there our lord is fulfilling this old testament prophet who uh, provided bread remember david was a king right and that king uh, by this asking for these five loaves instead he was given the loaves of proposition those 12 loaves he, this king also fed his uh his servants in an unexpected way because they weren't expecting to receive those loaves from the tabernacle itself but then there is um, uh, there is another event, and this is in uh, the second book of Kings, uh, chapter six, verse nineteen. All right. So in Second Kings, chapter six, verse nineteen. Let's take a look at that real quickly. Uh, David, when he came to um, uh, bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple says that he made uh, holocaust peace offerings. So now he's acting as a priest. He's offering holocausts and, and sacrifices. And then what does he do? In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 19, it says he distributed to all the multitude, both men and women to everyone, a piece of bread and flesh to eat. And everyone departed, everyone to his own house. Now, that wasn't a multiplying of the loaves. It wasn't a miraculous event. He actually just fed all the people. But here, David, not only as in the context of him as being king, but right after he offers holocaust, right after he offers sacrifice, so in the context of him as acting as priest, he gives to the people to eat. He gives them bread to everyone, men and women alike, gives them to eat. So you notice the, the connection there. There's, there was a king, there's a prophet, and then another king acting in the context of a priest. So priest, prophet, and king in the Old Testament provided bread for their people. And in a number of cases, in an unexpected way, and certainly in the case of Elisha, in a miraculous way of multiplying these loaves. However, that was only for 100 men. Uh, our Lord does it for 5,000 at this multiplication of the loaves. And remember I said that uh, David received of those 12 loaves of proposition that were set forth in the tabernacle. Remember how many baskets were left over? Verse 20 tells us they took up what remained 12 full baskets of fragments. So in this feeding of the 5,000, um, he feeds these 5,000 and 12 baskets remain. Now remember, this was done in the Jewish part of Galilee. And so by having 12 baskets left over, it's saying that our Lord is not just feeding those 5,000. He has come to feed all 12 of the tribes of Israel. Later on, we'll see in Matthew 16, where he points this out, he kind of narrows it in to the apostles. He says, how many baskets did you take up when you fed the 5,000? And they said, 12. And he says, how is it that you do not yet understand? In other words, that means something. It's significant of something. It's because he's come to feed not just those 5,000, but all the tribes of Israel. This multiplication of the loaves is meant for all. So it's pointing forward to the Holy Eucharist, which is meant for all who are received into the Catholic Church and are in the state of grace.
Okay, so that was the feeding of the 5,000 in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 14, uh, verse 14 through 21. Now, let's go on to the next uh, miracle that we see in this chapter. He dismissed the multitudes, verse 23, and um, he, he sends his disciples before him in the boat uh, to go over the water. And this is the miracle of our blessed Lord walking on the water, Matthew 14, verse 22 through 33. So um, we know the story, the crossing that, that boat, the, the crossing that sea in that boat, the winds came up, the seas arose, they were frightened. Uh, then our Lord comes walking to them on the water. Uh, St. John gives the additional detail that he was four leagues out, so he's miles out, miles out over the water. He's been walking on the water for miles to catch up to them. And they saw, they thought he was a ghost and, uh, you know, they cried out. And our Lord uh, tells them, you know, be of good heart. It is I, right? He calms, he calms them down. Fear ye not, right? But St. Mark gives an additional detail. So in uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 48, Mark chapter 6, verse 48, he gives the additional detail that our Lord would have passed them by. He would have passed them by. So that's interesting because... Uh, St. Mark is drawing out language that is used before for theophanies. A theophany is a revelation of God. And so in Old Testament theophanies, it says in a number of places, and we're going to look at those briefly, that God was passing by. God was passing them by. So it says in Mark 6 verse 48 in his account of this walking on the water miracle that he would have passed them by. But we see that expression used again in Exodus chapter 33, verse 22. Exodus 33, verse 22, when God revealed himself to Moses, there we see these words. It says, when God is speaking to Moses, he's saying, and when my glory shall pass, I will protect thee with my right hand till I pass. So God again is passing by. It's a theophany. God is revealing and he's making as though he's passing by. Right, he passed by Moses. He was going to pass by the men in the boat in the Sea of Galilee. So God passes by. At different theophanies, God passes by. We're going to see another one in just a second. So that was Exodus 33, verse 22. Let's look at the next one. There's another theophany, a revelation of God in the third book of Kings. Third book of Kings, chapter 19, verse 11. So in the third book of Kings, chapter 19, verse 11, this is where uh, Elias, or Elijah, the prophet, is on the mountain and he has wandered in the desert for 40 days, a little Lent of his own, and he comes to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, and God reveals himself to Elijah the prophet there on Mount Sinai, and again, God passed by. Let's look at what it says there. 3 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. The Lord said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passeth by. The Lord is passing by. So at these different theophanies, we see God passing by. Then we see also another. There's another verse in the Old Testament, and this is from the book of Job. In the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 11. In Job, chapter 9, verse 11, uh, Job is speaking about Almighty God, and he says, He passeth me by, and I do not comprehend him. You know, he, he comes by me, he passes me by and I'd see him not, right? So again, in this theophany to Job, Job in this sort of ecstasy says, God passes me by. So Mark chapter six, verse 48, God makes as though he's gonna pass him by. But there's one more verse in which this becomes significant. And this is in the moment of the resurrection, the day of the resurrection, Luke chapter 24, verse 28. In Luke chapter 24, verse, uh, uh, chapter 24, verse 28, uh, there we have our Lord and the road to Emmaus. This is just after the resurrection. He's walking with the two disciples and he's explaining to them the scriptures. He's opening to their minds and hearts the scriptures. And it says, as they drew near to the town where they were going, to Emmaus, he made as though he would go further. In other words, he made as though he were passing by. God makes another theophany. And then it's at that moment that he breaks the bread and they recognize him in the breaking of the bread at Emmaus. 
again, God made as though he were passing by. So by using this language, by uh, again having this moment where God seems as though he's going to pass by as he's walking on the water, he's making a theophany. It's a revelation of Almighty God. I want to focus in on uh, uh, one last uh, aspect of that. Uh, so, these remember, we know the story. These men are frightened. We, we know how that little story ends where they say, you know, who is this, right? Who is this that, uh, you know, even the, the wind and the sea uh, o- obey him, right? You know, uh, he came into the boat, the wind ceased. This is the moment as well when... Um, uh, St. Peter walks upon uh, the waters, right? Um, but I want to go back to uh, the Psalms. I want to go back to Psalm 106. Uh, it depend, if you have a RSV, it'll be Psalm uh, 10, oh, I'm sorry, it'll be Psalm 107, right? But uh, Dewey Rames will have to be Psalm 106. And so Psalm 106, we see this. They that go down to the sea in ships doing business in the great waters. Okay, those are their fishermen, right? Those who go to the sea in ships, right? He said a word and there arose a storm of wind. This is Psalm 106, verse 25. The waves thereof were lifted up. Verse 27, they were troubled. And verse 28, they cried to the Lord in their affliction. And he brought them out of their distress. And he turned the storm into a breeze, and its waves were still. Verse 29. And they rejoiced, and he brought them to the safe haven which they wished for. So Psalm 106 tells us who it is that stills the waves. You know, in the other account of St. Mark's account of the stilling of the waves, they ask, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? Well, Psalm 106 tells us who it is that the wind and the waves obey, and it is the Lord God. So it's almost a rhetorical question when the apostles ask, who is this that the wind and the sea obey him? The Bible tells you who the wind uh, and the sea obey, and that's Almighty God. So it's another theophany, a revelation of Almighty God, and it's again in this this moment where God makes as though he's going to pass them by. Um, So... um, here in this episode uh, of the stilling of the waters, we actually have the beginning of something that's called a chiasm, right? So we have a chiasm here. So um, I'm going to put that, uh, that chiasm up for you on the screen there. Okay, so here there is a chiasm that begins here in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. And this is where our Lord said, remember when they, they were frightened, they were in the boat, and they were troubled. Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good heart. I am, fear ye not. You might see in your Bible, it might say, it is I, but the, the Greek actually says, ego emi, which means I am. So he says, be of good heart, I am. That's the name of God, given in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Now, that's the beginning of a chiasm, and you can see the other end of the chiasm where uh, it ends in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, where our Lord asks the question, who do you say that I am, right? And those two are juxtaposed, right? They're sort of parallel passages. And then you see this this chiasm that's formed. You see how each line kind of mirrors the next one. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 31, where he says, O ye of little faith. This is that moment where uh, St. Peter began to sink and uh, our Lord stretches forth his hand and he says to St. Peter, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt, right? That's juxtaposed with uh, the moment where in Matthew chapter 16, verse 8, our Lord says the very same words. O ye of little faith, um, why do you think within yourselves because you have no bread? This is when our Lord said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And remember how we said leaven has to do with corruption? He says, beware of that corruption of the Pharisees. But they thought he was talking about bread. He's like, oh, it's because we didn't bring any bread. And he says, no, no, of you little faith, right? So here he says the same, self-same words in Matthew 16, verse 8. It's mirrored by that moment in Matthew 14, verse 31, where he says the same expression. And then just after that, in uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, the Pharisees came to ask our Lord a question. Well, that's mirrored by another event just a little further down, exactly one chapter later, Matthew chapter 16, verse 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to ask for a sign. You can see how those two are parallel events there. 
And then you have um, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, that our Lord went to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Now, that's the, uh, that is the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee. That's mirrored with our Lord went to the coast of Magdalene. That's the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee, Matthew 15, verse 39. So you see how those two are mirrored? Our Lord went to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, and our Lord went to the coast of Magdalene. One was the Gentile coast, Tyre and Sidon, Matthew 15, verse 21. And then Magdalene was the Jewish coast line, uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 39. Well, this chiasm then, you could see it's focusing in, it's zeroing in as these parallel passage, passages get closer and closer. We see they're focusing in on one set of passages in Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 through 28, and that's the first miracle for a non-Jew. This is very momentous because our Lord first came to preach to the Jews, and so now we have the first miracle for a non-Jew, which he performs uh, for a Canaanite woman. And this is where that moment where the, the Canaanite woman uh, comes to him and uh, you know, asks for this healing of her daughter, and our Lord at first doesn't answer her. And then finally he does answer her and he, uh, you know, when she demonstrates such faith that she's even, she's so humble and she says, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the table of their masters. Then our Lord said to her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it done to thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was cured from that hour. And that's Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. So you can see then in this chiasm that, uh, our Lord is focusing in these events on this one moment. This is actually the hinge of the Gospel of St. Matthew. It's the hinge because uh, here and also at Caesarea Philippi, which was a pagan place also, we see a hinge, a change taking place. Now our Lord is sort of going out to the Gentiles. So it's, it's a change in his, in his mission. And it, as it were, uh, he had this mission the whole time. But uh, this first miracle for a non-Jew uh, is uh, a really significant event because it means that God's blessings are going beyond just the firstborn, which Israel was considered like the firstborn. God's saying, I'm extending that blessing to my whole family, the whole human family, the non-Jews as well. Okay, so does that make sense? All right, let's move on then uh, to the next miracle. So this is uh, the hem of his garment. So um, this is just going to happen right here at the at the end of uh, after this. Uh, so we're we're done with the chiasm. Um, uh, we see the next thing is the the uh, the healing that takes place by uh, people touching the hem of his garment. Right. So uh, this is still at the end of chapter fourteen. Um, we see that. Um, he passed over the water. He came to the country of Genesar. Genesar, again, this is the, uh, the, uh, the Genesareth area. This is um, the uh, pagan side, right? The Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee. And it says they, they sent to the, uh, into that country um, uh, all that were diseased. All that were diseased, they besought him that, he might, that they might but touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched it were made whole. Uh, I think I mentioned this at the uh, catechism class the other day, but there we can see um, you know, a moment of, uh, uh, of healing that takes place through the use of a relic, essentially. Um, so here um, um, we see a couple of events that happen. There's some in the Old Testament, there's some in the New. Where, um, for example, in the fourth book of Kings, uh, chapter 13, verse 21, um, a body, dead body, touched a light, Elisha's bones and was brought back to life. It's that same Elisha who had multiplied those 20 barley loaves to feed 100 men. Um, when a dead body touched his bones, he's brought back to life. But it didn't just happen in the Old Testament, it happens in the New as well. In Acts chapter 19, uh, verse 11 through 12, we see that diseases and wicked spirits departed from people uh, who had cloths touched to them that had been touched to the body of St. Paul while he was still alive. So this is like his, his body's being a living relic because he was so close to God. Power, divine power was going forth from St. Paul such that they would touch his body and touch it to uh, these cloths to his body and then touch it to the sick or to those possessed 
and diseases and wicked spirits departed from them. So can you see how this is really pointing to the Catholic practice of relics, right? So next time you have a Protestant friend who's saying, why do you Catholics have this superstitious practice of relics? You say, this is not a superstitious practice. It's biblical, my friend. It's biblical, right? This is a biblical practice where God's power exudes even into the very clothing of those that were close to him. Uh, not only the clothing, but you know something? It goes further in Acts chapter 5, verse 15. Acts 5, 15, the very shadow of St. Peter healed those who were sick. This happened where, you know, they laid the sick in the path of where St. Peter was going to walk. And it says that they just, so at least the shadow might fall upon the sick. And it says there that all were healed. So they were healed by the very shadow of St. Peter going by him. You talk about relics. You know, Catholics don't go far enough as they went in the sacred scriptures uh, regarding relics. Okay, so that chapter then closes, and then we go on to Matthew chapter 15. And here we have the uh, discussion of the traditions of men. Okay, so this is often a challenge verse. Okay, so we're going to put on our apologetics hat and address this challenge verse that Protestants will often use to try and contest the idea of Catholic tradition, sacred tradition, which is so much a part of Catholic faith, but because it was a part of the early Christian faith. This is in verse 3 where it says, uh, Why do you transgress the commandment of God for your tradition? Right? And then in verse 6, it says, You have made void the commandment of God for your tradition. You know, our, well, our Lord says this, right? Our, um, our Lord is telling them that they are making void the commandments because of their own human traditions, traditions of men, right? So because of this, Protestants will take this verse and say, you see, con uh, tradition is condemned by Christ. But that's not what he's saying. Tradition is not condemned by Christ. He's saying your tradition, your tradition of man is being condemned the, when it contradicts the commandment of God because they were using these traditions to basically ignore father and mother and therefore, uh, as it says in verse uh, 6 and verse 9, they were ignoring father and mother for the sake of some other tradition that they had created, some sort of temple tradition that made void the commandment of Almighty God, a tradition of men that contradicted the commandment of Almighty God. However, that's tradition of men. There is a verse, however, in the New Testament that praises sacred tradition. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.14. It's a good one to commit to memory regarding this issue of uh, tradition. And there you have the words of St. Paul written to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, where he says, Stand fast and hold the traditions which you have learned, whether by word or by our epistle, by our letter. Hold fast to the traditions you have learned, whether it's by our word, oral tradition, sacred tradition, or by our letter, written tradition. And that's exactly what the Catholic Church maintains today. Oral tradition and written tradition. We carry on both, as St. Paul says we should do in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Okay, so a little verse to tuck away in your toolbox there uh, whenever this issue comes up and people try and challenge the Catholic idea of sacred tradition. Okay, let's move on uh, to another, um, another miracle. So... <clears throat> Now, as I mentioned, we already talked about the, the, uh, the Canaanite woman uh, when we were talking about the chiasm. We had talked about the Canaanite woman um, who, again, was a Gentile, a Canaanite. She is not a Jew. And so she has a miracle performed for her. As I said, this is sort of a hinge in the Gospel of St. Matthew. It's a, kind of a key passage where um, our Lord starts to go out to the Gentiles, as it were, right? Um, and then we have in verse uh, 32... Through 38, the feeding of the 4,000. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32 through 38, the feeding of the 4,000. So this is a, a miraculous event which takes place. Um, and this time it takes place on the Gentile coast, the Gentile side of Galilee. Some people will say, you know what? St. Matthew must have made a mistake. There's an account of a 5,000 and then, you know, what chapter later, there's an account of feeding 4,000. This is probably all the same event. He probably just doubled it. Some copyist wrote this and just copied the event. And instead of 5,000, he put 4,000. So there's repetition, needless repetition. That's nonsense. That's hogwash, right? 
These are two different events. And they are very specific and very distinct because our Lord even says in, in uh, chapter 16 uh, that there's, there are two events and they have different significance. They have different symbolism. So let's look at the feeding of the 4,000. Uh, the disciples said to him in verse 33, when should we have so many loaves in the desert to feed so many, right? How are we going to feed so many in the desert, right? How are we going to feed uh, all these people uh, in the desert? Well, our Lord says, how many loaves have you? They said, seven. This time they have seven loaves, not five from the other time. They have seven loaves this time and a few little fish, a few little fishes, right? Uh, so he commands the multitude to sit down upon the ground, taking the seven loaves and the fishes. So notice they have seven loaves and a few fish, three fish, a few fish. Seven and three. What that means, there's a, there's a, 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 we can draw a line from that to the commandments, right? The commandments, the 10 commandments, there's the three that pertain to God. The first three pertain to God. And then the next seven pertain to our interactions with mankind. So they have the seven loaves and the three fish. That's all the Gentiles have. Because you know, those 10 commandments, they are actually just the natural law spelled out. The natural law is what the Gentiles had. They didn't have the divinely revealed Torah, right? The, the books of Moses, right? They had the, sev they had the, uh, you know, the seven loaves and the three fishes of the Ten Commandments to go by. That's all the Gentiles had is the natural law, that which is written on the heart of men. In case you don't know what the natural law is, it's that which is written on the heart of men. All men know that. It's the idea of I, should, I need to do good and avoid evil. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. All those things that are in the Ten Commandments, that's the natural law. Everyone should know that and follow that, regardless of where, whether they're, what their religious background is. Just as a human being, that's what's written on our heart. So the Gentiles hear this healing, this, I'm sorry, this multiplication of the loaves take place, takes place in a Gentile country. That's what they had to go on, was the seven loaves and the three fish of the Ten Commandments, right? The natural law to go by. And that's all they had to feed themselves with, right? But our Lord multiplies that. Remember in the healing of the 5,000? Remember what they started with? Five loaves, right? They started with the five loaves, okay? And uh, the two fish, right? So the five loaves the f makes us think of the five books of the Torah. That's what the Jews had. They had the divine revelation. On top of the natural law, they had the five books of the Torah, so we can kind of make a correlation there between those five uh, books of the Torah and the five loaves that they started with. And the two fish, what are the two fish? Love of God and love of neighbor, right? You shall love the Lord thy God for thy whole heart, thy whole mind, thy whole strength, and love thy neighbors thyself. They had those things to feed themselves from, but our Lord multiplies that and gives them a new law in the new covenant. So here, uh, the... Um, 4,000 are commanded to sit upon the ground. Our Lord does the similar thing. He gives thanks, breaks the bread, he gives it to his disciples, and gives it to them to give to the people. And they all ate, and they had their fill, and they took up how many baskets? Remember how, how many in the first multiplication? There were 12. How many in this multiplication? There were seven left over. Why seven? Seven, remember, is the number of the covenant. Seven is the number of the covenant. And so it's saying then that our Lord is going to make a new covenant with the Gentiles. That's remarkable. It's remarkable, but it's also foretold in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6. In Isaiah 42, verse 6, uh, we have it foretold that um, our Lord would make a covenant and it would be a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, verse 6. So, this is what is our hope, right? So it's a beautiful uh, symbolism then. You know, he multiplies the loaves for the Jews, and then he multiplies the loaves for the Gentiles. First, there was the covenant with the Jews in the Old Testament, and then there is the covenant with the Gentiles in the New. That covenant expands to the Gentiles in the New. That number seven is the number of the covenant we remember from Genesis chapter 21, verse 27. In Genesis 21, verse 27, we see the first time there's a connection between covenants, oaths, 
and the number seven. That's when Abraham has an oath. He makes an oath with someone for the rights to use a certain well, and they seal that oath, that covenant. First time that's used in sacred scripture, they seal that covenant with seven ewe lambs. So that number seven, which is actually the same word for oath in the Hebrew language, uh, is a symbol of a covenant. So whenever you see that seven, just think this is a sealing of the covenant or a renewing of the covenant a renovation of the covenant. And in this case, with the Gentiles, it's a symbol of the fact that that covenant will go out, a new covenant will be made uh, for the Gentiles. So now let's, uh, let's move on, shall we? Let's, uh, we're we're going to uh, foray into, um, into uh, um, uh, the next section here, okay? As I said, if you have questions, uh, keep... Uh, submitting those, you can submit those on uh, uh, Facebook or YouTube, and we'll get to those questions um, in just a moment. Let's go into um, Matthew chapter 16. So we're going to plow ahead into Matthew chapter 16. This is a, uh, a really great uh, uh, chapter. It's, uh, it's really the, the chapter that a lot of Catholics might have down because there's the reference to St. Peter, right? So um, when uh, our Lord uh, you ask them, right? You know, they, they, again, here's, remember, as part of that chiasm, uh, we saw that before, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to our Lord and um, they were asking for a sign. Remember, we saw that in the chiasm before. Um, here, they, uh, here's the sign. Here's where they come and they ask for the sign, uh, a sign from heaven. Now, consider he had just given a couple of signs. He'd given a sign to multiplication of the loaves, both to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Uh, so they shouldn't need another sign, right? However, um, uh, they come, they ask for a sign. And our Lord says to them in Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and a sign shall not be given to it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. So remember, we saw that already, right, in Matthew chapter 12, where he talks about uh, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So the sign of Jonah the prophet. So our Lord is identifying himself with Jonah. That's a key idea because we're going to see that in just a moment that it's going to have a, take on a new meaning uh, with regards to St. Peter. So let's take a look. Uh, so then uh, let's, let's take a look in at verse 9. So this is Matthew chapter 16, uh, verse 9. He says, Do you not understand, neither do you remember, the five loaves among the 5,000 men, how many baskets you took up? That was the 12. And then verse 10, Nor the seven loaves among the 4,000 men, how many baskets you took up? That was seven. He says, Why do you not understand uh, that it was not concerning bread that I said to you, oh, be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? So he's saying, do you not understand what these mean? The, the five, five loaves among the 5,000, 12 baskets remaining for the Jews, the seven loaves among the 4,000, seven baskets remaining for the Gentiles. He's saying, I'm going to feed the Jews. I'm going to make a new covenant with the Gentiles, okay? Then our Lord Jesus came to the quarters of Caesarea Philippi, and this is Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Now, um, this is a fascinating place. Uh, I had the grace of being there at Caesarea Philippi uh, just back in November. And it's uh, a really spectacular, uh, spectacular thing to see. In Caesarea Philippi, uh, there, it's a long distance from the Sea of Galilee. So remember, these miracles were taking place right near the Sea of Galilee. Then our Lord turned from the Sea of Galilee and began to walk. He walked for hours upon hours upon hours, deep into Gentile territory, by the way. He's walking for a long time. His apostles must have been thinking, where on earth is he going? Where is he taking us? And he goes to Caesarea Philippi. And at Caesarea Philippi, he approaches this large rock formation. It's a natural rock formation, huge rock cliff with a great cavernous opening at the entrance to it. And at the time that our blessed Lord was there, there was a great temple built to the false god, Pan. There, child sacrifice was performed. A horrible place, a place ruled by the demonic. 
And our Lord walks up. He doesn't actually get onto the temple precincts, but he's up there at Caesarea Philippi, close to that horrible temple, pagan temple, where disgusting immoral rites, impure immoral rites were taking place and child sacrifice would take place on some sort of regularity. He turns, he turns around then with that as a backdrop, this horrible pagan temple as a backdrop. After walking for hours upon hours, it probably took all day or maybe even an overnight to get there after his disciples are wondering, why is he taking us deep into this pagan Gentile country? He stops and he turns around and he asks them a question. He says, whom do men say that the Son of Man is? Now, they probably were thinking, have you taken us all the way here to ask us who people say that you are? They respond with the popular vote, right? Some say John the Baptist, some say Elias, other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But our Lord Jesus said to them, but whom do you say that I am? There's the end of that chiasm. Who do you say that I am? Now, that's a quite a place to ask that question. Because behind him, there's this huge rock, a temple, a pagan temple, where there is active, pagan, disgusting rites going on. Our Lord says, even in the backdrop of all this paganism behind me, who do you believe that I am? Of all places to doubt, if one wanted to, of all places to doubt the divinity of Christ, that might be one where they might be tempted to doubt, because that might seem to be a place where the devil was winning. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yes, I believe that even in this pagan precinct. Our Lord Jesus answered him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah. Son of Jonah. But we know later that his name is actually, he's the son of Ioannu, which is John. Why does he use Jonah here? It's kind of a derivative of that. But why does our Lord use Jonah? That's because, remember he said the sign, no sign shall be given it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Our Lord identified himself with Jonah, and now he's telling Peter, you are the son of Jonah, you are my son. He's saying, Peter, I am making you like my adopted son. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, bar Jonah, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you. You didn't get this through hereditary flesh generation, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed this to you. And I say to thee that thou art Peter. Now consider the context. There's that huge rock background, pagan temple back there with this big open gaping hole. That open cavernous uh, uh, hole in that rock wall was what they would call the gates of hell. The pagans called that place the gates of hell, and that's where the child's sacrifice would take place in this open cavern that they called the gates of hell. They believed that was the gate of hell and that they would have to appease, appease the you know, false gods by killing someone and sending them down uh, into the open cavern called the gates of hell. But our Lord says, you, Peter, are rock. Not this backdrop of rock that seems so strong, this fortress that seems like a pagan stronghold. That's not the rock. You, Peter, are the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, it's a reference to where he was standing right behind him. This pagan place that they called, the pagans called the gates of hell. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. Powerful words, right? But there's so much more that we can expand on these words. There's so much more we can draw out from these words. You'll hear some Protestants say, okay, our Lord is using a switch of language here, right? He says, look, if you look at the Greek, he says, you are uh, Petros, and upon this Petra, I will build my church. If you know Greek, it's just the endings are changed depending on whether it's masculine or feminine or depending on what the thing is doing in the sentence, right? So by saying Petros and Petra, there's no change to the substance of what he's saying. He's saying, you are rock, and upon this rock, I will build my church. 
Some Protestants will say, aha, this Petros, it, maybe it means little stone, and Petra can mean a large stone. So he says there's two different things going on. They're trying to say that St. Peter is one kind of stone, but this other stone is the real stone. And, you know, but the problem is, was our Lord speaking in Greek or was he speaking in Aramaic? He was actually speaking in Aramaic because we know from John chapter 1, verse 42, the name that he actually gave Peter. It wasn't Petros, as it was rendered in the Greek in St. Matthew's gospel. It wasn't Petros that he said, Peter, this is your new name. In John 1, 42 says what his name was. It was Kepha, Kepha, which is rock. And so how this phrase goes in the Aramaic is, I say to you that you are Kepha, and upon this Kepha, I will build my church. There's no difference, in other words. In the language that our Lord used, there's no difference between, you know, uh, Peter, you are rock, and upon this rock, it's the same word. So Protestants will try and introduce a false dichotomy, saying that, yeah, this, there's two different words going on, Petros meaning small rock, Petra meaning large rock, and so he must be saying, I'm the real rock, uh, you know, but that's just nonsense, you know, and uh, especially if you realize our Lord wasn't speaking Greek, he was speaking Aramaic, and we know the Aramaic word that he gave uh, to uh, Peter, which uh, the Aramaic name he gave to Peter was Kepha from John 142, and uh, it's the same word that he uses in both places. So he says, yes, Peter, you are that rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. Uh, and the other thing, too, is um, sacred scripture corroborates this, right? Sacred scripture corroborates this because um, we see in uh, sacred scripture, in the book of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, chapter 21, we see that the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem had 12 foundations, or 12 foundation stones, and upon them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This is Revelation 21, verse 14. So Revelation 21, verse 14 confirms that the apostles are the foundations, the stones upon which our Lord builds the church, and most particularly, uh, St. Peter is the stone upon which he builds the church. But I want to also focus in on uh, the, the other thing about those gates of hell. Now, I ask you, are gates offensive means in a combat, or are gates defensive in a combat? Gates are obviously defensive and so when our Lord says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, we should understand that that's defensive. We should be on the attack. We are on the attack bringing the faith and conquering and destroying hell. We are storming the gates of hell, reclaiming the souls that are captured by the gates of hell, that are captured by hell and the devil. We are reclaiming those souls for Almighty God. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. The gates of hell will not stop us. That's what we should understand from that uh, reference to the gates of hell. But there's one other figure that I want to focus in on about those gates. It goes back to Caesarea Philippi and that large uh, stone rock wall in which there was this large cavern and the gates of, which they would call the gates of hell. That was the place, as you remember, where they, this pagan sacrifice would take place. Years after our most blessed Lord, an earthquake happened at that place. An earthquake is a movement of rock. So a movement of the rock closed off those gates of hell, closed off the place where those pagans would perform their child sacrifice, R destroyed the temple that was there. So a movement of the rock destroyed the temple, closed off those gates of hell. And if you go there today, there's no longer a temple to Pan there. There are only pilgrims who come to venerate the place where our Lord made St. Peter the first pope. True victory, a true victory for the rock, St. Peter, uh, who conquered the gates of hell. One last thought I want to uh, mention here is about the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the keys of the kingdom of heaven and this 
opening and shutting, bind, there shall bind, whatever you bound on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose upon earth will be loosed in heaven. This is language that is back in the Old Testament. Our Lord's using language that has been used before in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. It's a pretty easy one to remember, Isaiah 22, 22. Uh, by the way, there should always be a, a passage from sacred scripture that we learn each day or at least each week. Say, I'm going to learn this passage this week. I'm going to learn this passage this day. I'm going to memorize this passage. So whether it's from catechism or your Bible study or your own spiritual reading, draw out a line from sacred scripture that you can memorize and keep with you. Uh, it doesn't have to be any of these here, but if there's one that's important to you, start with that and have a passage that you can kind of turn over in your mind and uh, keep close to you. So this is Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, where we have the words of uh, the prophet who is saying to uh, a new person who would be appointed to be the prime minister, or chief of staff, or what they would call in the Hebrew, the al-bayit. The al-bayit was the one over the house. He was placed over the house in charge of the house of David, right? So this was a permanent office that was in the royal house of David in which you would have a sort of prime minister uh, a person who is like a, a head of the cabinet, if you will, uh, chief of staff, if you want to put it that way. He, he was the one who was called the al the one over the house. And it's describing the properties of this person who is going to be placed over the house. One was being removed for not doing a good job, and another would be replaced. And the, this is uh, what we have written in Isaiah 22. Notice the similarity as I read it. Keep in mind Matthew chapter um, 16 verse 19 that we just saw with the key, right? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever thou shalt bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Whatever thou shalt loose on earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. And then going back to Isaiah 22, verse 22. I will lay the key of the house of David upon his shoulder. He shall open, none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. Can you see the similarity there? There's laying of the keys upon someone. Well, he has the authority to open and no, no one else shall shut. He has the authority to close and no one else shall open. Very similar to the language of our Lord where he gives the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, this time in the plural, as it were, the Old and the New Testament. That's what often is uh, depicted in uh, symbolism the, by the two keys that St. Peter has to unlock both the Old and the New Testament. And whatever he binds on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever he looses on earth will be loosed in heaven. Um, there's a couple of uh, interesting things when we look at, you know, when you go back to a verse and you find something that's similar, it's always good to go back and read a little bit before and a little bit after you get a good context, right? Uh, you know, you have uh, a lot of Catholicism in the context there, okay? So notice that he is the person who is over the temple in verse 15, Isaiah 22, verse 15. He is the one who is over the temple, Okay, he's over the house. And he says, um, you have made for thyself a dwelling in a rock. Hmm, we saw St. Peter was a rock. Then uh, we see in verse 19 that this person who is over the house is in a ministry. That is an office. That is uh, uh, an ongoing uh, ministry, right? And then he says, I will clothe him with thy robe. The robe is a symbol of authority and power. So he is being given power, real power, by being granted these keys. And it says in verse 21, as Isaiah 22, verse 21, he shall be as a father to the inhabitants. So this person who is over the house will be as a father. So uh, it's one of the reasons why we call the Pope uh, a father. Pope is from, you know, it's a derivative of Papa, which is in the Italian, right, of father, right? And so uh, then also this role of the one who is placed over the house uh, is the role of, uh, of a father. So that's what St. Peter is being given. Um, these keys of the kingdom, which uh, were mentioned in the Old Covenant, that were mentioned under the Davidic kingdom. But what this really should point us to, and I think this will be helpful in your discussions with Protestants, is if you also focus in on the fact that, you know, because sometimes we say, look, this is, this is talking about St. Peter and his primacy, his first pope. And that's important to mention. It's important to mention those, those details, but always bring it back to Christ, 
okay? Because they might think, well, look, you're just exalting this Pope. I don't hear you talking about Christ. And you say, look, the fact that he is the chief of staff, the fact that he is over the temple, he is the al-bayit, the one who is placed over the temple, the fact that he is this shows that he is in this office of a Davidic king. So really, the fact that our blessed Lord is making St. Peter the one who is over the house, he is really saying that Peter is not only the one who's the chief of staff, prime minister over the house, he has the keys, he has the authority, but he's also saying about himself, our Lord is saying about himself, I am that Davidic king because I am, I am establishing what the Davidic kings had, which is they had a prime minister. He is over the temple. He is over the house. He has authority. He's clothed with a robe of authority. Um, he is be as a father to the people. And that's saying then by making St. Peter uh, the, the one who is over the temple, it's saying that he is actually the Davidic king uh, who has come to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. So um, that's Matthew chapter 16. Uh, there's a few more uh, things we can focus in on. Um, we might as well close out the chapter. I, I was going to take some questions. We will take some questions, but why don't I, before I do this, let's, let's close out the, uh, the chapter here. Uh, this is an important turning point here at this pagan place in Caesarea Philippi where our Lord reveals, right, and it confirms St. Peter's statement that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, and then uh, uh, he, he starts to talk to, about his passion now. Uh, before I mention that, though, one last point that I, I want to mention. Uh, I think I've mentioned it in other catechism classes. It might have been before we started the live streaming. Uh, but it's this point where he gives this name to Peter of Cephas, right? And Cephas is given this name as a confirmation of what he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? But consider that the anti-high priest, the one who was actually over the temple at the time, that is not Cephas, but Caiaphas, had a different question. He asked our Lord, he adjured him to say, whether or not you be the Christ, the son of the living God. So Cephas, St. Peter, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Caiaphas who was the anti-high priest, as it were, right? So he was the high priest of the old covenant, of the old temple, whereas St. Peter, Cephas, the high priest, the al the one who was over the temple in the new covenant, confirms that he is uh, uh, the Christ, the son of the living God, and Caiaphas had the doubt. He didn't believe that he was the Christ. He didn't believe that he was the son of the living God. But St. Peter, using the same terms, says, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. Because it was at the trial of our blessed Lord that Caiaphas asked that very question, tell us, art thou the Christ, the Son of the living God? So we can see even by that, even by the name Caiaphas and its similarity to uh, uh, Caiaphas, the St. Peter's name, we can see that our Lord is making of St. Peter a new high priest in this new covenant. So in verse 21, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time our Lord began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the ancients and scribes, the chief priests, to be put to death and to rise the third day again. Now, uh, this is the first prediction of the passion. Our Lord will give four more predictions of his passion. This is the first time. Each time our Lord gives a prediction of the passion, we're going to see he gives more detail about what's going to take place in that passion. So he's slowly preparing them for the cross, the suffering that he's going to undergo. And uh, he's tr trying to prepare them for this, uh, this reality that our Lord is going to have to suffer. Uh, St. Peter, although he's made, um, you know, a high priest, as it were, of the new covenant, um, he says, no, far be it from you. He doesn't understand the cross yet, the mystery of the cross, right? And our blessed Lord says, get behind me, Satan, right? When St. Peter says, don't, you know, you, this is not going to happen to you, Lord. And our Lord says, get behind me, Satan, as though, as though St. Peter were tempting him away from the cross. He's, and uh, he says, thou art a scandal to me. Literally, a scandal. You are a stumbling block, a stumbling stone to me. He's just named him the stone, the rock. And now he says, you know, you're a stumbling stone to me. You're, you now become a stumbling stone because now you don't want me to enter into the passion and thereby glorify God 
and redeem mankind by the cross, right? And that's when our Lord confirms uh, in verse 24 that if a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So by saying that, he says, if a man's going to follow me, he's going to take up his cross. A cross was a mode of execution in the days of our Lord. Just imagine the impact. I want you to feel the power of our Lord's words. If a man is going to follow me, he's going to have to take up his mode of execution and follow me. Take up his cross. They knew what the cross was. It was a means of your being put to death. Remember our Lord also said things like, I send you out as sheep among wolves. We're like, oh, that's a beautiful image, sheep among wolves. What happens to sheep among wolves? They get eaten, as I've said before, right? So he says, the man who saves his life shall lose it. The man who shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. In other words, we shouldn't try to preserve, you know, people like, oh, I don't want to fast. I don't want to hurt my health, you know. I mean, obviously we want to take care of our health, but, you know, we want to have a little sacrifice, sense of sacrifice for our Lord, you know, a sense of embracing the cross, right? But he says, what does it profit a man if you gain the whole world but lose his soul, Right? Uh, and then um, uh, notice that uh, here, verse 27, Matthew 16, verse 27, that the Father will render to every man according to his works. So I got another apologetics hat back on again. Notice uh, this is that whole works debate, right? That's a, that's a whole different, that could be a whole class itself, this whole works and merit and uh, how Protestants see it and how Catholics see it. Uh, some Catholics have a, um, you know, Pelagian view of, of works, um, which is erroneous. But, you know, we want to have the right sense. But notice that it says the Father will render to every man according to his works. Some people will say, you Catholics have your works, but I have faith in Christ. We can say, well, our Lord says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, that God will render to every man according to his works. Right? And then so he, our Lord says, again, there's a final verse in chapter 16 where emphasizing the power, the, the point that the kingdom of heaven is the church here on earth. He says, there are people who are here that shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, sometimes people say, oh, look, there's a prophecy of our Lord that didn't come true. Because there's people, those people died. They didn't see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It's because some people have a Protestant view of what the kingdom is. And they think Christ is going to come and have this, this thousand year reign here on earth. That's a Protestant, that's called Kiliasm. That's been condemned by the church. We don't have that concept. We believe that Christ is reigning through his church even now. And so the son of man coming in his kingdom is the son of man coming in his kingdom, which is the church. So he says, you, there are people who are living here now, verse 28, there are people who are living here now that won't die till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom because his kingdom was established when he established the church right there at the end of our Lord's lifetime. So there we go. We uh, actually made it through three chapters. That's uh, not too bad. Let's, uh, let's see if we have uh, some questions that came in. Okay, so we've got a few questions. In the picture of the temple on your left, what are the large white holes in the courtyard? Large white holes. Ah, I think I see what you're talking about. Those holes are actually steps that go down, right? Because the temple was up on a mount that was on um, uh, not uh, Mount Sion, but Mount Moriah. There's uh, seven mounts, seven, you know, pinnacles or peaks in the uh, city of Jerusalem. One of them is Mount Sion. This is Mount Moriah. And so those are steps going down from the temple to the rest of the city, Right? So remember that temple was built up on a mount. It's all destroyed now. So even that temple that we see and it looks a little bit elevated, it was even higher because uh, that's been destroyed. So those are steps going down. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So this is, uh, yes, this is a verse. Okay, the next question is this. Can you explain the meaning of Psalm 136 where it says, Blessed be he that shall uh, take and dash thy little ones against the rock. Mm. Yeah, that's a challenging verse. That's because, and you know what? It's challenging because people, some people uh, even have removed it from the office. In, in, uh, I think uh, in some places they, they have cut that out of the divine office. We don't cut it out of the divine office. It's part of the Psalms. Uh, all the Psalms are good. Um, but this is a reference to uh, the fact that we are to take all the, like the little ones. What are the little ones? It's the sins. All those little sins, all those little things that we think are small, 
we need to dash them against the rock, which is Christ, okay? Because, yes, I know St. Peter is the rock, but our Lord is also uh, the rock. Uh, you, know, you might say St. Peter is cut from that stone of Christ. Uh, so blessed are they that dash the little ones against the rock. It's talking about all the little sins, all our faults. We need to dash them, destroy them against the rock, which is Christ. That's the symbolism that's going on in Psalm 136, right? So even the small things, the little things, the venial sins, we need to bring those to Christ. We need to conquer those. That's what's being uh, mentioned. That's what's being referenced in Psalm 136. Okay, a couple of other questions. Um, okay, so did God create hell before he created the angels, already knowing that Lucifer and the bad angels were going to rebel against him? Uh, so it's not clear in my mind when it was that God created hell. I mean, he certainly uh, created uh, hell, the, the eternal fire, which was prepared for uh, the devil and his angels. Um, and if so, would they have had knowledge of hell, of what hell was to avoid it? So the way an angel chooses something is different than the way we choose things. We are pretty dumb, right? We're pretty slow on the uptake. And so it takes time for us. We have to reason to things, right? We reason. Angels, but they, they do something that we, they call intuit. We reason, but they just intuit. They, they see it. And as soon as they see it, they choose it and they will it with their full will. And that's why they don't revoke their will. We do revoke our will, our will sometimes, which is what makes it possible for us to be forgiven. We choose one thing and then we realize, boy, that was pretty dumb. And now I repent of that. And now I can be forgiven if I truly repent of it. The angels, they see it on all its entirety and all its context, and they choose it and will it. And they stay willing that just as certainly as you will this. If you understand the idea that two plus two equals four, right? Two plus two equals four. Now I want you to un-understand that. Obviously you can't un-understand that. Once you understand what two plus two equals four, once that mean, what that means, you can't unwill your assent to that fact that two plus two equals four. You're gonna assent to it once you understand what that means. The angels, when they see it, they, it's like they see the whole thing to their greatest, to the full extent of their ability to know, and then they will it. Now they, th that's the point of the evil of the angels is even though they knew that there would be a punishment because they knew God was just, even though they knew that it would, there would be punishment, they saw it would be better to be punished than to serve God in humility. And it's not the case that it's better to be punished than to serve God in humility. It's better to serve God in humility. But in their pride, they wouldn't do it. Right? So even though they knew there were going to be consequences, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they still willed to, to, to choose this. It's not clear if they knew the fire. They probably did, they, uh, but because uh, they, they knew more of God than what we would understand in our, uh, certainly in our natural knowledge. Um, but they still chose to do it out of their pride. Okay. Uh, can you teach an apologetics class? Uh, yes, I can. <laughs> so that is something I've, I've been, uh, wanting to do. I used to teach one here and, and then that kind of, I don't know, went by the way I said, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I certainly, uh, definitely want to, it's something I, I really have uh, a liking for, but, um, okay. So, um, Let's see, there's a couple of other questions. Um, boy, this, do you have a few hours for this answer? Uh, probably not, but let's, okay. So what is the best argument against sativacantism in your opinion? Okay, so, um, well, there's a, there's a number of ones, but uh, one is you can reference Vatican I. Not Vatican II, Vatican I. Vatican I says that God would not leave us without heirs to the throne of Peter. God would not leave us without People, you know, a, a pope to uh, to occupy the seat of uh, the vicar of Christ, right? In other words, God would always provide the, for the fact that we would have uh, popes, right? So even when there is a pope that died, and even there's some instances in the history of the church where it went on for a couple of years, a couple of years, uh, but he always then provided a pope to replace uh, the one who had died. So God would not leave us without uh you know, uh, heir to the throne of St. Peter. But the, in the general tenets of Sativacantism, and it depends which ones you ask, right? Some will say, well, this one was the last pope. But no, this one was the last pope. Well, this one was, and then he lost it and all this stuff. So a lot of them, though, will say that Pope Pius XII was the last one, right? 
So um, if you point out then, if okay, Pope Pius XII was the last one, then we've lost all the cardinals then, because all the subsequent cardinals then must have been created by false popes, right? I obviously don't believe they were false popes. Um, but if you believe that Pope Pius XII was the last one, then all the other cardinals that have been created since are not real popes. We've lost the College of Cardinals, and we have lost the means that the church has left us for having an heir to the throne of Peter, which goes against Vatican I, with the doctrines of Vatican I. So it's simply, theologically, it's not, it's not possible that God would leave us without the heir to the throne of Peter. So that's, that's one of the arguments. There's many others, but let's move on because we don't have a few hours. Okay. Good question, though. Okay. Uh, good evening, Father. Should we be reading Protestant Bible, Bible translations? I grew up with the King James Version, KJV. Um, so the answer is no, we should not. We should not be reading uh, Protestant Bible translations, okay, because there are things which uh, uh, they get wrong, right? There are things, you know, translations which are inaccurate, especially the King James uh, Bible translation. That was done off a 13th century Byzantine text, uh, so that's a rather late text to use for your translations. And so the King James Version is, um, even though it has, you know, archaic language or language, uh, it's not a, a good one to use. Um, the oldest English Bible translation, do you know what the oldest English Bible translation is? This one right here, it's the, it's the douay Rames. The douay Rames Bible is the oldest English Bible that's in print. It's older than the King James Version. In fact, uh, the King James even used it as a sort of cross-reference to check their, their work, as it were. So uh, I would also not use the New American Bible, okay? So there's, you heard the New American Bible, the NAB. Um, I actually believe that NAB stands for not a Bible. Um, there are a lot of errors in that. Um, you know, there are footnotes in there that are positively heretical. There are footnotes in there that are positively her heretical, including uh, the one, the commentary on Genesis chapter 6, in which uh, the New American Bible in the footnotes claims that the flood story was just a myth introduced, stuck in the Bible from a bunch of pagans from Babylon. That's heresy. That's heresy, and that's in the, in the New American Bible. So don't believe that. I wouldn't read the New American Bible. It's just a loose translation anyway. Um, I would read a uh, douay Rheims Bible. If the douay Rheims language is hard for you, um, I think it's, it's fine to use the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. If it's easier for you, I know the language is a little, little easier. But even there, uh, I, I don't so much recommend that, but it's just some people, it's just like the thee and the thou and, you know, the... Um, if thou hadst been this, and they don't really follow that language, um, then I think a, a good segue is to use that uh, RSV Catholic edition, the Ignatius Bible, uh, as it were. Um, but I do prefer the, the uh, douay Rheims Bible. Um, so other, you know, so those other translations, uh, you might just, you know, dispose of them in a, in a, don't throw them in the garbage, but, you know, you could... Uh, burn them in the place, you know, it's not, we're not Bible burners, but I mean, if it's a false translation of the Bible, but you want to dispose of it in a way that's, uh, it's not just going to end up in the trash, okay? Okay, so if the church says uh, something is no longer a sin loosed on earth, is it loosed in heaven? Is it no longer a sin in God's eye? Okay, so it depends what we're talking about with regards to sin. So that, 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 um, uh, that statement of our Lord in Matthew chapter uh, 16, um, verse 19, is that the Holy Ghost will preserve the Holy Father from promulgating a doctrine that all are bound to believe. It's a very careful language. It's not simply whenever the Pope is teaching on faith and morals, he's infallible. That's not the case. It's when he's promulgating a doctrine for all to believe. That's the Vatican I definition of the infallibility. He's binding all people to believe something. So the Holy Ghost will preserve him from binding all Catholics in this formal way, binding them under sin to, uh, to you know, believe a doctrine. Uh, he's going to be prevented from um, uh, introducing an error of falsehood in, in that regard. Um, so... The church can also, however, say, you know, it, it, that something is no longer sin in this way. So if it's something that's part of the natural law, the church isn't going to change that. Church can't change that. Uh, you know, something that's part of uh, our, um, uh, you know, from divine authority, right? Um, 
you know, de fide divina, they call it, right? So um, it's of the faith from divine origins given by Christ itself, right? The fact that we need water for baptism, right? There's one obvious example. Uh, the church is not going to change that, but the church can change things where they say, is this no longer a sin or is that no longer a sin? The church can change things in a matter of um, discipline, right? So if they, um, you know, for example, the ember days on which we were, we were bound under sin uh, to observe the ember days, the church can change that discipline and say, you're no longer bound to, uh, you know, under grave sin to, um, you know, observe the ember days, or at least, you know, that uh, you're still bound to observe them, but you're not bound under grave sin. The church can change that kind of thing, a disciplinary thing. That can be changed by the church. And so the church, uh, in that sense, then it's not a sin in God's eye if if they change that law. That's a, that's a liturgical law. It's a church law. It's, a, it's an ecclesiastical law uh, that can be, can be altered. Okay. So, why has the church since Vatican II ceased to discuss the unjust practice of usury and calling out usurers? Uh, probably because there's a lot more fish, <laughs> bigger fish to fry in the, in the whole mess. Uh, I don't know why, however, in the, the church as a whole um, uh, has... Uh, has, has, you know, ceased to, to address that. So, um, good question. Um, but I think there are, uh, maybe because it's hard to get away, you know, you put your money in a bank and they're going to be using it and they're going to be charging interest and whatnot. And, you know, but, um, uh, it's just they're bigger fish to fry. I think that's, that's one of the issues. So, um, all right. We have people that don't even realize that Missing mass on Sunday is a mortal sin, right? Or, um, you know, that contraception is a mortal sin, right? Some people don't realize those things. Uh, or that you're obliged under pain of mortal sin to abstain from uh, unnecessary servile work on a Sunday. It's grave matter if it's, you know, two to three hours or so of unnecessary servile work on a Sunday. That's grave matter. People don't realize that. So there's bigger fish to fry before we get to usury. But uh, that may be why uh, the church, uh, or maybe other reasons, but... Okay, so um, yes, so uh, there's another question that came in. Can you explain the symbolism of the blood being washed out of the temple from the sacrifices? Yes, I can, and it's such a beautiful symbol. It shows up in um, uh, John chapter 7, verse 37. So in John 7, 37, um, although you don't, may not realize that that's what's going on at that moment. So that's in the Feast of Tabernacles. Is one of those moments where... Uh, the church, in the Old Testament rather, in Israel would, um, as part of their uh, Old Testament rituals, uh, they would pour water all over the altar. They would, they would sort of have this bucket brigade of water that they'd bring up from uh, the, the stream, right, the, the, the Gihon or the Kedron brook, and they would bring the, this water up and pour it over the altar, and they would keep pouring water and water all over the altar. Now remember, with every sacrifice, when they would offer the, uh, the blood of a sacrifice, they splashed that blood on the four sides of the altar. At the four corners of the altar, they would splash the blood in a way just like this, so that the blood would go on both sides, at the, both sides at the next corner, both sides at the next corner. That's a lot of blood, a lot of sacrifice. And so that altar was a pretty bloody looking thing. So they would, several times a year, they would have as part of their rites, they would pour the water on the altar. And this water would flow out. They had even channels built under the altar so that this water could be channeled away and out. And it would uh, join into the Kedron brook. So they'd be pouring the water on. And so what do they see? It would flow out of the right side of the temple what would they see flowing out of the right side of the temple? Blood and water. As that altar was being washed, blood and water was flowing away from that altar as the water, as the, you know, uh, blood was washed away. And it would flow out from the channel they built under the temple. It would flow out of the right side of the temple. As Ezekiel uh, saw in his vision, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 40, blood and water would flow from the right side of the temple. Uh, Ezekiel saw water flowing but uh, from the right side. Uh, however, from our Lord's side, when it was pierced, 
blood and water flowed from the right side of the temple of his body, right? So that was pointing forward to our Lord who was going to give up his body, the temple of his body on the cross, that blood and water would flow out, washing the, you know, the heart, washing the, uh, the altar, as it were. And so it, that, uh, that washing that would take place um, uh, would happen uh, several times a year. One of them was on the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the Feast of Tabernacles, which is, we see it depicted here, uh, they're actually not washing the altar in this image, but that was a part of the Feast of Tabernacles that was that last day where they would illumine those candles, those seven, the, the large, uh, not seven branch candlestick, but the, the large um, candelabra um, uh, illuminating the whole temple. But our Lord says in uh, ver John chapter 7, verse 37, it says, on the last and the great day of the festivity, and this is that day on which they were pouring water onto the altar and that blood and water was flowing out from the right side of the temple, joining the Kedron Brook, that same brook that our Lord crossed when he uh, endured his passion, was brought back from Gethsemane into Jerusalem. On that last and great day of the festivity, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth in me out of the, uh, as the scripture saith, out of his very heart shall flow rivers of living water. Some translations will say out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, but it's not like uh, belly as in abdomen. It's out of his very heart is, is, is a, a good translation of it. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 47 has a reference to that. So he's saying this, out of his uh, very heart shall flow the rivers of living water. And in verse 39, now this he said of the spirit, which they would receive, it's pointing then towards this fact that uh, Christ would be the one that would really provide the waters that flow from the right side of the real temple, right? If anyone comes uh, to those waters to drink of them, we receive life, right? The waters of baptism and also the blood of the Holy Eucharist. So that's the, that's the symbolism that was happening uh, with the blood being washed out of the temple. Very good question. Um, so are the seven mounts of Jerusalem, a uh, symbol for the seven sacraments. They certainly could be. I would say uh, predominantly they are a symbol of the covenant, right? That was the place of the covenant. Remember the seven? Seven is the number of the covenant. So that was the place of the covenant, but that was the place of the old covenant, right? Um, there was the different, the different mounts. Uh, one of them was Mount um, Moriah. That's where the temple was built. But do you know there was a higher mountain in Jerusalem than Moriah? That was Mount Sion. Why was Mount Sion higher than the mount where the temple was? It's because Mount Sion was the location of the cenacle. That was the place where the Last Supper was offered. That was the place where the sacrifice began. Christ offering himself at the Last Supper, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. That's the higher place. It's a greater covenant. It's a greater sacrifice. And it's greater than all the Old Testament sacrifices. And for that reason, it was done on Mount Sion, a higher location geographically than Mount Moriah where the temple was. So it could be that those seven mounts are symbols for the sec seven sacraments, but certainly the whole place of Jerusalem with those seven mounts would have you know, brought to the Jewish mind the idea of a covenant. It's the place of a covenant, those seven mounts. Okay, how could Satan not recognize that our Lord was not God, or did he know this? Okay, so uh, Satan uh, did not know that our Lord was not God. Uh, he didn't know. He wasn't sure, right? Um, he was taking guesses, um, but our Lord hid that from him, right? That's why Our Lady was married to St. Joseph as a means of hiding the fact that he was um, conceived in a miraculous way, the incarnation. And uh, so he didn't know, and that's why he was testing him. If thou art the Son of God do this, you know, if that's the son of God, do that, you know. But he wasn't sure because if he was the son of God, he wouldn't have tried to tempt, if he thought that our Lord was God, he wouldn't have tried to tempt this man, Jesus, to worship the devil because he knew God would not have done that, right? So he said, well, maybe he is a man. So he tries to get our Lord Jesus to worship him. If you, you know, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all these things. God would never do that. The devil knows that. So he wasn't sure. Is this a man? Is this God? He just wasn't sure. So uh, God hid that from him uh, so that he could accomplish the, um, the redemption. Um, okay. 
So let's see. We have a question. Um, let's see. Someone wants to know uh, who the ancients are, right? So the ancients would have been. Um, uh, it depends on the context of what they're talking about. They they could be referencing the uh, the, the fathers, the the Abrahamic fathers, right? The patriarchs. Um, but if it's in our Lord's time, they would be referring to. Uh, the Sanhedrin, right? The the ruling body, right? These seventy people that ruled was kind of a ruling body of uh, the Jews in the time of, of our Lord. Uh, so the the priests and the ancients, right? Um, that was the uh, that's who they were, right? Um, okay. So uh, oh, looks like there was the same question about the devil tempting Christ. So it looks like we were able to kill two birds with one stone on that one, huh? Okay. Um, so, okay. Okay, let's look. Yes, so there was a question then about Matthew 24, uh, which uh, we are going to get to, so we can be patient. But um, that the question was about Matthew 24, uh, verse 28. Where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered. This is another good translational issue. So I'm glad this question was asked because uh, a good translation will show up um, the, uh, the erroneous one. Um, there's an RSV translation. I don't know if we can call that up um, or not, but uh, the RSV translation of Matthew 24, verse 28, um, which um, might have something a little bit different. But uh, anyway, I'll read you the douay um, uh version of that uh, verse, right? So Matthew 24, verse 28, where he says, he's talking about the end times, and he says, wherever the body shall be, there the eagles shall be gathered together, right? In some translations you'll see, uh, and this is in the New American Bible, I believe this translation is there, where the body shall be, or it says where the corpse shall be, there the vultures shall be gathered. That's quite different though. Where the corpse shall be, there the vultures shall be gathered, versus where the body is, there the eagles shall be gathered. You see, the body is actually here a reference to the body of Christ. The eagles, well, eagles, do they feed off of dead flesh, or do eagles hunt for live, living flesh? They hunt for living flesh. So where the body is, there are the eagles, which are known for their keen eyesight, which is why St. John's symbol is that of an eagle. Uh, the ones that see and have the keen eyesight to discern where they see the body, there the eagles will gather, right? So uh, this is the RSV translation then. Is, uh, this is the NAB translation. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. That's a horrible image now if we realize the body is actually a reference to the body of Christ. Those that see the body of Christ the eagles that have clear vision and live off of living flesh, that's where, they're, that's where they will gather so that they could feed off that living body. But where the corpse is and the vultures, that's a horrible, that's a different image, right? So it's a rather hopeful image in the Douay Rames, not so hopeful in the uh, NAB. Um, it looks like the RSV has the same, uh, where the body is there, the eagles will be gathered together. So that one uh, is okay. I'll say one thing though, there is something in the RSV which doesn't, um, doesn't have the power that the, du the Douay Rames does. And this is at the moment of the Last Supper in J St. John's Gospel, where it says, um, St. John reclined, rested his head on the breast of our Lord. In the RSV, it says, St. John laid his head near the breast of our Lord. Saint, the Douay Ram says he rested it on the breast of our Lord. The RSV says near. That's not as intimate as the fact that St. John actually rested his head on our Lord's breast at the, uh, at the Last Supper. The way they did that, of course, in case you're not aware of how they would eat, they had a low table, very low to the ground. They would uh, rest on their left uh, left arm, and they would eat with their right. So they were sort of at this angle, and then St. John was then in front of our Lord, and he could just easily just sort of lean his head back quickly, and he would be resting on the breast of our Lord, right? They were in close, uh, close proximity there. Okay, I think we are uh, short on time here. Uh, so... Um, 
we'll have to wrap it up. So unfortunately, there's a couple of questions still, but uh, I do want to keep to our time. So our normal uh, mode of operating is that we will all hold forth for about an hour, and then after that, I'll answer the questions for the Bible study. Uh, for the catechism, I try and just keep it to an hour because uh, we've got a whole range of people uh, ra a range of ages, uh, range of ages watching at that. So we want to keep that to an hour. But this, uh, we're out of time. So uh, uh, I thank you for coming. Uh, we ask you to enter then into the Triduum with a great prayerful spirit. Uh, try and meditate quite a bit on our Lord's passion, and suffering, um, and let's go ahead and close with a prayer. Okay, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I will give you all a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos, et maniat semper. Amen. Good night now.